Hey, everybody. Elida Zweidler from Kay with Engaging Leadership, where we're all about helping you engage with the leaders in your organization um, in order to move your career forward and also create an engaging experience for the people who work with you so that they are motivated and focused and on track and producing the kinds of results that will get them and you promoted. So, so glad to talk with you today. It's been a couple of weeks since I've done one of these. I had some personal stuff I was taking care of with my parents, but I'm really glad to be back with you now. And what I wanted to talk with you today about is um, the the issue that comes up in teams so often where different people see a situation or see a problem from different perspectives and like even will tend to remember something differently. So the reason this came up is I was reading Bob Iger's book, The Ride of a Lifetime. Now Iger has been chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company for the past couple of decades. And before that he was chairman of ABC. And the book was great. There are a lot of great leadership lessons in it, wisdoms from his lifetime of leadership. And I found his approach uh, that he described to be really thoughtful and humane. Though, of course, I don't know whether or not those experiences, those ideas that he talked about really translated to the day-to-day -day experiences of the people on his front lines. And that's, that's the piece that I wanted to sort of talk with you about today that you know our view from the top of an organization or our view from our particular department or division or function might not be the same as how other people are seeing what's going on you know or what other people are experiencing um, it's always striking to me one of the biggest lessons that I learned from my work with teams especially was how different people can experience and interpret the exact same situation very differently. So when I was reading Iger's book, I was especially interested when he got to the part where he describes what happened when Disney bought Pixar. So if you're not a fan of animated films, you may not be aware of this, but this was a huge move in that industry. Um, Pixar had... Um, you know, had some early success and then really grown and was being very successful at a time when Disney animation was really shrinking into the background. They had had a bunch of flops. And so, you know, Pixar was really the going concern. And when Iger took over as head of, of um, Disney, one of his early moves was to start to create a relationship or recreate a relationship because there had been one before, um, when Michael Eisner was head of Disney, but that had sort of fallen to the wayside. So Iger had reached back out to Steve Jobs, who was supporting and funding Pixar and started to build a bridge again. And in the moment when Disney decided to buy Pixar and Pixar agreed to go along with it, that was a really big, um, big move in the industry. And you know, a big move in the lives, the professional lives of Bob Iger, Steve Jobs, and also Pixar's co-founders, Ed Catmull and John Lasseter. Now, I had read Catmull's book, Creativity Inc., a few years before. And so what I was really curious about was how their two different um, descriptions of that series of events might be similar or different. And I'll tell you, I wasn't surprised to find that their stories weren't quite aligned. You know, people tend to understand events from their own point of view, and our interpretations are really formed by what we know and clouded by what we don't know. And I think the most striking example that came up for me in reading those two books side by side was this one. So Iger describes the day of the announcement of Disney's pick purchase of Pixar. It had taken you know, months of negotiations to get to this point. And Iger arrived on the Pixar campus and Steve Jobs greeted him and said, we need to take a walk. And on that walk, Jobs tells Iger very confidentially, he had only told a handful of people at this point that his cancer had returned and that he may not have very long to live. And Jobs chose to share that information with Bob Iger, according to Iger, because they were close, but also because Jobs was concerned that, that that might cause Iger to want to pull out of the deal. So here he is having to make this decision, a, a go or no go decision. And Iger decides that he would go ahead and go forward with the deal. They had a lot riding on it. And really, you know, Pixar was 
Jobs was an important part of it, but he wasn't the only part of it. There was a lot they were getting in that deal. So he goes ahead with it and they do the um, press conference for the day. And then they do this big town hall with Pixar's employees. And, you know, to put this into context, because Pixar was really at the top of their game, being purchased by Disney was not on the radar of any of the people who worked for Pixar. So there was a real concern that there were there was going to be some anxiety and upset um, following the announcement. So they did a big town hall with all of the employees. It was a really long day. And at the end of that long day, the way Catmull describes it, he says that he and Lassiter and Jobs had an opportunity to catch their breath together. And here's how he describes it. He says, the minute the door shut behind us, Steve put his arms around us and began to cry tears of pride and relief and frankly, love. He had succeeded in providing Pixar, the company he'd helped to turn from a struggling hardware supplier into an animation powerhouse with the two things it needed to endure, a worthy corporate partner in Disney and in Bob Iger, a genuine advocate. That's from Creativity Inc., page 251. Now, in my first reading, because I read Creativity Inc. first, I was moved by the scene and moved by the notion that Steve Jobs cared so deeply for the company that it would bring him to tears to find it, you know, now in good hands. But with a new perspective from Iger's account, the scene becomes even more poignant because Jobs' tears may have also carried the grief of his own experience and the news that he was still processing that his cancer had returned, which Catmull didn't know about at the time, as far as I know. You know it's such an important reminder when we read Ed Catmull's description of what he thought was going on, that anytime we're interacting with someone, even if we're really close to them, they may be going through much more than we could possibly know. And our interpretations of their behavior, their emotional expressions, the things they do and say, may not be based on the whole story. They may be, you know, based on just what we know about them. So I just thought that was so fascinating. And I wanted to share that with you today. And then the other, there were a couple of other examples that came up of different interpretations of events between the two books that I also thought were kind of fascinating. So throughout the story of the, of the, um, of the acquisition, Iger implies that it was his grand plan to have Catmull and Lasseter not only continue to lead Pixar, but also to take over the leadership of Disney Animation. And the hope was that the creativity and success that Pixar had had could bring some of the magic back to the Disney Animation Studio. Now, Catmull's version of the story is that it was Jobs' idea to put him and Lasseter in charge of both Pixar and Disney to avoid creating some internal competition. Now, it's not clear where this difference of perspectives came from, or even if it was one or just kind of how the book was written. But you can imagine how each interpretation could have a different impact on how people might feel about going to work each day. So the belief that the idea had come from Iger might foster a deeper commitment to his leadership if Catmull and, Leder and Lassiter had known or believed that it had been Iger's idea for them to lead Disney animation. Certainly it could have also had an impact on their loyalists and how they felt about going to work for Disney. On the other hand, the belief that it was Jobs' idea, that he was looking out for, for um, Catmull and Lassiter, um, might contribute to more of a feeling of we have to look out for our own. Now, there's nothing in either book to imply how this really played out, whether it was one way or the other, but I'm raising it here as an example of how a company's folklore and its origin stories can impact what it feels like to work there. And also the differences that stories from different leaders can have, the impact that those different stories can have on how people feel about the part that they're playing in the organization or how the organization looks at them or looks at their division or looks at their, their group. And that can have an impact on how people feel about going to work and also on how they get along. Now, in another smaller example, both books talk about how preserving Pixar's culture was really an important part of the negotiation. Iger describes a two-page list of culturally significant issues and items that we promise to preserve. It's a quote from page 144. Catmull describes it as, quote, a seven-page single-spaced list 
with, quote, 59 bullet points. That's from page 248 of uh, Creativity, Inc. Now, this difference is a small one. Was it two pages? Was it seven pages? Does it really matter? I don't know. So I don't want to make too much out of it. You know, it could be that they're referencing two different documents, or maybe the two-pager that Iger mentions is just a subset of the seven-pager that Catmull's talking about. I'm not sure. I'm guessing in this case, the different memories didn't lead to any kind of conflict. But I can easily imagine a scenario where two people are in a meeting together with this kind of different recollection, and they're arguing about that document, and either talking about two different things or talking about the same thing and remembering it really differently. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating and so important about the fact that we see and remember things differently. Because sometimes those different memories, those different perspectives can't lead to conflict. People will hold on to their point of view and argue about which version is right or which version is true. And unless you have some kind of real record or videotape or something of it, you know, you won't really ever know. Or some people might just have different interpretations that they're not arguing about, but they're more behind the scenes, but informing what they think about each other, whether those memories were accurate or not. Now, even if they don't become a source of conflict, discrepancies in what people talk about or what they remember about, about um, major events can be interesting pieces of data to explore when you're getting to know a team or a company culture. So for example, in this case, we might see these different descriptions as a clue to the different work styles that Iger and Catmull might have. So we might imagine, for example, that Iger is a big picture thinker who focuses on capturing the essence. It's directionally correct to say that they had a two-page document. While Catmull could be a more detailed thinker, more focused on the specifics, he knows it was a seven-page document, he knows it was 59 bullet points. I don't know for sure, but if I were working with them as a team coach or if I were thinking of going to work for either of them, that's something I would want to dig into is what are their styles? You know, who are they big picture? Are they more detailed? And is one or the other of those going to be a better fit for me and how I like to work? So as you're going about your work with other people, I invite you to stay really curious about their point of view and remember that they may see things and experience things very differently from how you're seeing them and experiencing them. They may remember things differently through their lens, just like you're remembering things through yours. So I want you to stay open to those possibilities and stay curious about how your interpretations and how their interpretations might be influencing the decisions that you're making or the way that you're participating or the ideas that you're coming up with. And I also want to encourage you, anytime you work with other people, to be creating a shared record that can serve as some kind of institutional memory of your work, whether that's meeting minutes or capturing lessons learned or capturing some other kind of document that summarizes what you've agreed to. Because it happens over and over again that people will walk away from the same meeting having had two very different experiences, having um, two very different ideas about what was agreed and what was decided. So if you can create a shared record of that and everybody reviews it and sort of uses that as data to make sure that the final record is correct, that can go a long way toward reducing the kind of conflict that can come from these sorts of situations. So thank you so much for being here today. It was fun chatting with you and sharing what I found from reading these two books. I really recommend them both. They're fabulous examples of sort of leadership memoirs. Um, and especially if you've been a fan of either Disney or Pixar, it's just fun to see stories about how they became what they are now. Great talking with you today. Take care.